Welcome to Grace Church. We're glad that you could join us and connect with our church here. For the best online experience, go ahead and download the Grace Church app. From there, you can take notes, find the Bible, and fill out a response card. You can also find all of our past messages there in case you want to watch, rewatch, or share. Grace Church Online is made possible by faithful and generous people just like you. If you'd like to contribute to the work and ministry of Grace Church, you can do that through the app or at worcestergrace.org. Well, good morning. Man, it is so good to see all of you. It's great to be back here this morning. I've been away for a couple of weeks. Last week, my wife and I were at the kickoff for the Global Leadership Summit. We're going to be a host site for that again this summer. Super excited about what that is to come, but really glad to be back with you as we wrap up this series together today. Now, today is time change day, and so I'm going to need some feedback to ensure your alertness, okay? So I want you to respond to me by saying the same phrase that I do. I'm going to say, stand strong, and I want you to say the same thing back. Stand strong. Okay, so stand strong. Stand strong. Okay, now turn someone to someone next to you. Wake them up out of their slumber and tell them, stand strong. stand strong. All right, that's what we're talking about today. Standing strong and not quitting in a world that is overwhelming to us. We're wrapping up our series from the book of Daniel. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 6 if you want to join me in your copy of the scripture this morning. Pastor Dave did an amazing job of kicking off our series the last two weeks. If you have not watched them, you should. Go back to worcestergrace.org, click on messages or download the Grace Church app and uh, catch up because those were amazing messages, especially last week talking about worship. And today... We're going to focus on one of the most famous stories in the book of Daniel, but also in the entire Bible. It's Daniel and the lion's den. And if you're familiar to faith, you're like, well, I probably heard that when I was in Sunday school sometime. Maybe you've never heard this story, but you've heard the phrase, man, I feel like I'm in the lion's den, right? Like life is overwhelming me and things are about to attack me. How do you stand strong when you're in that kind of a situation, when you're trapped in the middle of the lion's den. That's what Daniel was. He was trapped. Anybody ever been trapped before? I kind of felt like I was trapped last week as we were flying uh, back from the Global Leadership Summit last weekend. I felt like I was trapped. Uh, how many of you have seen that direct TV commercial? This one right here where the, the guy's flying and the kid's kicking him in the back and he's drinking, right? Yeah, well, this was just a commercial until last week. It became a reality in my life. My wife was sitting in the seat by the window. I was in the middle seat, which, by the way, is always the trap seat, right? You feel trapped, and there was a woman sitting next to me. And I was talking with this woman a little bit about faith and stuff like that when these, uh, this family came on, and these two little boys with cute curly hair sat down behind us. We're like, oh, that's cute, you know, with their mom and everything. Not so cute, right? So the entire flight, they thought that the tray in front of them was an Olympic sport. And so they were flipping it up and down the whole time, and we tried the evil eye. We tried the nice smile. We tried a whole bunch of things. Things, nothing worked. Finally, the woman next to me takes the glass of water that she had from the flight attendant, goes to drink it, and this kid in that exact position just wails on her seat. She spills it all over her, a little bit on me. We're frustrated, not a good flight, right? Completely trapped. And then our return flight. I get on the flight to come home. My wife's on the window seat. I'm in the middle, and another woman is sitting next to us. And on walks, I'm not kidding, I don't make this up, the exact same two boys. And it was like watching Groundhog Day or the Browns over and over. Same exact outcome, okay? Kicking us the whole way. I get up in the middle, go to the bathroom. I talk to the flight attendant, like, hey, is there any way you could, like, put the fear of God in them or something? You know, I'm a preacher. I'll help. You know, it's, it's all good. She's like, no, we don't get involved in family. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? So felt trapped the entire flight, right? You've probably felt trapped before. 
Sometimes it's because of circumstances that you can't control, like what seat you get on a plane. Sometimes uh, you could control it because you get trapped by choices. And the evil one has set a whole bunch of traps for us in our culture. Things related to our sexual experiences and, and, and pornography or alcohol and drugs, really big and heavy ones. Or maybe it's just things that we maybe would kind of downplay, like pride and arrogance and gossip and slander. Or maybe it's things that are pretty good at, at face value, but if we get in too far and we, we take them, we can get trapped and get overwhelmed quickly, like you know, shopping or online shopping or Kohl's cash, Right? We get in there, we're like, man, all of a sudden, I've made some decisions I'm not proud of. I've made some decisions that have me completely trapped, and I don't know how to get out. How do you stand strong in that kind of a moment? Well, Daniel stood strong when he was trapped, and I think we can learn from his experience. There's a tension when you're trapped between uh, the trap of compromise and, and the trust of God's capability. That he will provide a way out. That he will provide victory in the middle of that. And maybe because of those traps, your spiritual journey has been really frustrating to you. You feel like, man, all it is is two steps forward and three steps back. I make some progress and then I get trapped. And I'm frustrated about that. How can I stand strong? In the middle of that, how can I live with conviction when everyone around me is maybe hostile to those convictions? And the story of Daniel and the lion's den today features some reminders of how to stay strong. It's kind of like the ultimate escape room. I know I've seen some of you post pictures of going to these escape rooms, right? Where you're kind of trapped and you've got to figure a way out and you get out and then you take a picture as a group like, hey, we accomplished this, right? This is the ultimate escape room, Daniel in the lion's den. And the world that we live in, sometimes we feel like, hey, how do I escape all of this pressure? And Daniel faced a choice. And, and listen, in this story, the lion's den gets a lot of attention, and people like to focus on it because it's kind of the, it is the supernatural part of the story. But I think there's something way bigger than the lion's den that happens in this story. And it happens way before the lion's den. It's way before Daniel's put in there. A decision is made that actually sets the course of the entire story. It's, you could say, Daniel's defining moment. See, in Daniel chapter 6... We get to the end of Daniel's life, or towards the end of his life. At the beginning of the book, he's like a teenager. And now in chapter 6, he's somewhere around 80, 85 years old at this point. And so this, these first six chapters encompass his entire life. And one key of Daniel's life is the fact that he has a characteristic of being faithful. He was faithful to God. Everybody knew it, based upon the way he lived his life. And it's really important to remember, as a backdrop, to the lion's den story, because I think it's just as significant. And so here are three reminders the, from Daniel to us if we want to stand strong when we're overwhelmed. Okay, first one is this. We need to keep on going. We need to keep on going. We have to keep going even when we would rather quit. I bet some of you would say today to me, if we were being honest and had a conversation, that you feel like you've been dealt a really tough hand. Maybe you feel like it's even unfair you can't get ahead. Maybe it's financially. Things just keep happening. Or, or maybe you can't get ahead relationally or, or professionally. You keep getting passed up for the, for the promotion or whatever it is. And you're like, hey, I cannot get ahead. Life has absolutely tossed me a bad hand. Or it's a health diagnosis that you've recently gotten. You're like, this is not fair. Well, that's kind of how Daniel could have responded. Because of the choices that people in generations before him made, his entire group of people, his entire nation was in captivity in a foreign land. He really was in hostile environment. He was in enemy territory because of the decisions of other people. He could have quit. He could have complained. He could have pouted. He could have cried foul. But he didn't. Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. 
The king is about to decide how to reorganize the government. And he wants to put uh, uh, one person in charge of the whole thing. And Daniel's the guy that kind of pops up to the top. Because in verse 3 it says, Now Daniel, he so distinguished himself from among the administrators and the, the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. The king said, this guy has what it takes. His character that he was developing, he kept going when he could have quit because he realized something. Daniel realized that happiness is not found in your circumstances. It's found in your choices. Happiness is not found in your circumstances, it's found in your choices. So Daniel decided, hey, even though this is unfair, even though I've been dealt a bad hand, I'm going to do the most with what I've been given rather than complaining about what I wasn't given. And so he kept going. He kept taking his next steps of faith. And he made wise choice after wise choice after wise choice. And it led to him having exceptional qualities that people noticed. The king noticed it. His peers noticed it. Everyone started to notice it. And, and here's the thing. Whenever we're dealt a bad hand in life, we, we want the result of what happens in Daniel's story, but we don't want the process. The process is hard. But those exceptional qualities that Daniel developed were because he continued to do them over and over and over and over. And people took notice. Look what happens. Verse 4. At this, the administrators and the satraps, those are the people he's about to oversee, yeah, they're like, I don't like this. They tried to find grounds and charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. Check this out. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. <laughs> These guys are trying to figure out a way to bring a good man down. I mean, can you imagine the scrutiny that Daniel faces? They're trying to find just one little thing that they could go back to the king and say, hey, don't pick Daniel. Because he did this. I mean, picture the scrutiny of going through something like that today. Having all of your transcripts, your bank accounts, your email history, your browsing history, all of the texts that you sent, your phone usage, your relationships, the words you've spoken, all of that chronicled to find one thing that could disqualify you. You talk about scrutiny. They check him out, but they can't find anything. His character is strong. It reminds me of like sports. When you are the road team in sports, you kind of go into enemy territory. You're the hostile environment. Listen, I'm a Buckeye fan. I've been to a number of Ohio State games in Columbus, and all the people are there, and it's kind of a fun experience, and that's 100,000 people all cheering in the same direction. But I have really enjoyed more going to road games. I've been to a couple. And this year I got to go to a road game. And it was so exciting to walk around another school's campus with Ohio State gear on. They would mock you. They, they called me names. They booed me. They did all these things, and everything was crazy. You go in the stadium. The game starts. They're booing your team. They're making fun. They're throwing stuff at you until you win. And then you walk out, and you're like, I can't hear you. You score a road win. Right now, Daniel didn't have that kind of arrogance. But what he does here? He scores a road win. He's in enemy territory, and his character absolutely silenced the opposition. How did he do it? Two things. He was faithful in his responsibilities and faultless in his character. Now, he wasn't perfect, but that was the overriding tide of his life. And that's the first step. If you want to stand strong, to be faithful in your responsibilities and faultless in your character. You see, it's not really the, the way we want it. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's great, Nick, but I kind of want the microwave version of that. See, I want to think that if I do everything right by the book, then everything will go right by how I think it should. Stop and think of this for a minute. That did not happen to Daniel. Don't misunderstand this story. He did everything he should have done, and he still ends up in the lion's den. Even when you do what is right, you still have to trust God. President Harry Truman said it this way, Fame is a vapor, popularity an accident. Riches take wings, 
Those who cheer you today may curse you tomorrow. Only one thing endures. Character. Character. Will you make the choice to be faithful in your responsibilities and faultless in your character? The responsibilities of being a man or a woman in your marriage, with your children, at work, and at school. To be faithful to doing those things God's way. That is how you stand strong in enemy territory. Don't fall for the trap of compromise. Like a mouse looks at the cheese, it looks tasty, but you get in too far, you're trapped. Don't do that. First reminder, keep going. Second reminder, ask for help. To ask for help. Write that down. Daniel's detractors, they realize, hey, this guy's so faithful, uh, there's nothing we could find. We did the background check, nothing came up, right? But our best shot to bring this guy down is to go right at his religion, his faith, his trust in God. And so they decide to kind of put together a little scheme here, and they approach the king, and they know if they go to the king and they tell him to bring Daniel down, he's not going to want to because he wants to appoint him the leader, and so they go at it from the angle of pride. They go to the king and say, hey, king, you're the king, right? You know, the king? I have an idea. What if, what if you came up with a rule that everybody could only worship you for 30 days? Just 30 days kind of raises, you know, your self-promotion thing, and you're the king, right? The king's like, huh, Sounds pretty good. Let's pretend I came up with it. And he so goes ahead and makes a decree, okay, which is important because it can't be reversed. As soon as he makes a decree, these guys are like, ha, got him. Now he's trapped. He either gets to compromise or have conviction. If he compromises, ha, he's not who he says he is. If he stands with conviction, ha, we're going to get the job and he's not. Listen. In my opinion, this is the lion's den of the story. Right here is when it happens. The lion's den isn't actually in a cave where a whole bunch of lions are that they put Daniel. The lion's den happens in Daniel's house right here when he finds out about this decree. The bullseye is square on him. And what does he do? He says, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published... He went home upstairs to his room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, don't miss this, just as he had done before. So Daniel's like, hey, when everybody around me turns against me, I'm going to turn to God. This is a bold, powerful and kind of breathtaking response. Not only is he willing to give up a promotion and a pay raise, he's willing to risk his life. Now, why would he do that? It's, it's, it's kind of found in that last phrase, that just as he had done before. So, in Daniel chapter 1, if he's a teenager, and in Daniel chapter 6, if he's maybe 85, let's say 70 years have happened in his life. It says that three times a day he got down on his knees, just as he had done before. So I went ahead and did the math, and I'm not great at math, but it's somewhere over 75,000 times he had done this. That's how you get victory in hostile environments. You're prepared. When the trap was set, what did Daniel do to stand strong? He did what he always did. He was already ready. He got on his knees and he prayed. He had 75,000 some prayers leading the way. I mean, he could have got up and ran to the king. I mean, he clearly had some favor with the king because he was about to put him in a great position. He could have ran and said, hey, king, I don't think you knew what you were doing there. He didn't do it. He could have led a protest march. Hey, I'm being treated unfairly, but probably wouldn't have been many with him. He could have ran to the little K king. Instead, he went to the capital K king. Before he could stand strong in what he believed, 
he bowed down to the one in whom he believed. He didn't go hide. He didn't go run away. Now, we might misunderstand that from the passage, thinking he went to his house and upstairs, but the window was open and upstairs in a house with the window open. That's where everybody could see. He knew exactly what he was doing. Where do you go when you're trapped? The late Billy Graham said, prayer is a lifeline to God. Daniel treated that as a lifeline. He obviously believed it. And the administrators, they trapped him. They caught him. Look in verse 11. It says, these men went as a group. And they found Daniel praying. And what was he doing? Asking God for help. Praying for help. Now, it's interesting because it makes some sense to us. Like, yeah, when I get trapped, I pray to God for help too. Like, God, help me, save me, get me out of this. It's kind of like a desperation prayer. I don't think that's what Daniel was praying. I think Daniel was for the 75,000th sometime praying a prayer of dependency. God, I trust you and I want your help. And when life gives you more than you can stand, you kneel. Some people say to me, oh, well, you know what? There's really nothing else we can do, so now we should just pray. I get it, but no. We should start with prayer. There's nothing more than we can do than pray. We should always pray first. That's the first place. Not the desperation heave, but the dependence, the trust. I trust you, God. I trust you. I trust you. Do your prayers sound more desperation or dependence and trust? If you want to stand strong, you need to cultivate the habit of having prayers of dependence. So the reminders we have are to keep on going and to ask for help, and then there's one final reminder. is that when you do that, you get to watch God work. And the men who heard Daniel praying, they realized they had him trapped. So, I mean, if it would have been today, they would have, you know, popped out their iPhone and they would have recorded it and they would have put, you know, uh, you know, up on social media and they would have tagged the king in and look, hey, look, look at your boy Daniel. But instead, in their day, they go ahead and they run to the king like, hey, king, verses 13 to 18, like, hey, did you see what happened? Daniel is doing what you said he couldn't do. And the king is stressed. He's like, oh no, that is not what I intended to happen. And so the text says that he thinks all day long about how he can reverse this, but he can't because of the law. And so he orders Daniel be brought to him and he throws him in the lion's den. And there's this really interesting comparison that happens in the story at this point. The comparison between the king up in his comfy royal palace and Daniel in this dirty, caved lion's den. And you would think that one would be having a way better experience than the other, and it's true, but it's just not the one you think. The king is restless, and he's tossing and turning, and he can't sleep. Daniel's over in the lion's den, calm as can be. He's sleeping like a baby. The king, he passes up the entertainment for the night, it says. He's not even interested because he's so distraught. Daniel, man, he's down in the lion's den and he got to see a blockbuster hit. An angel appears and shuts the mouth of a lion. He's like, this is cool. Well, what does that tell me? It tells me that the peace that you are desperately looking for and you're chasing after the happiness you want to find, that peace is only found in the presence of God. It'll never be found in the prestige of a palace. Whatever comfort you want to put around you, whatever things that make you feel happy and good, they're never going to last. Peace is found in the presence of God. It's the only place it's found. And so the next morning, the king wakes up from his rough night of sleep. Maybe it was time change day then too, I don't know, right? And he goes down and he's like, when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And the text doesn't tell us how long this was, but, you know, was it a second? Was it immediately? Can you imagine that panic, that wait? Is he alive? Is he there? Daniel answers, may the king live forever. And then he tells him about the movie. 
spoiler alert, my God sent his angel. And he shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed. He gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. But when Daniel was lifted from the den, oh, I love the Bible. No wound was found on him. Why? Because he had trusted in his God. No wound. It wasn't even a battle. It wasn't even a fight. Nothing at all. We, when we keep going and we ask God for help and he moves, uh, listen, we might not be kept from the lion's den, but we'll be with the one who can shut their mouths. And then a bit of irony, the story ends with the people trying to trap Daniel. They end up getting the fate that they wanted him to get. Them and their family are tossed into the lion's den and they're crushed. And the king issues a decree to celebrate Daniel's God. Total road win. The trap was avoided. God's favor was on Daniel. Look at the last verse in this text. It says, so Daniel prospered during the reign of King Darius. See, Daniel prospered. Why? Because he had the favor of God. Because he chose character over comfort. He chose to be faithful to heaven's king, not the earthly king. He went after a faithful testimony, not some sort of fleeting treasure, right? He chose commitment over compromise. He made the choice. The lion's den experience is the supernatural work of God. But man, the choice before that, that was the real story. And God worked. And I believe he still works today. Listen. We have no idea, we really have no idea what hangs in the balance when we say yes to God day after day after day after day. There's no shortcut. There's no microwave version. It's day after day to be faithful to his responsibilities and faultless in his character. We have no idea what God will do when we say yes. It reminds me of a story that happened back in the 1930s. In North Carolina, where there was some preaching revivals that broke out. And they would do it under these big tents. And one of the preachers' name was Mordecai Ham, and he came to this, this city, and the place was packed. The tent was just packed. And one night, two 14-year-old boys show up, just kind of checking it out. They weren't really interested, other than there was a lot of people. And they started listening to the music, and they looked in. They couldn't find a seat. They were just standing in the back, and it was totally packed. You know, all over the place, people. And so they listened for a little while, and eventually they kind of like, well, if there's no seat, we're just going to go on and do something else. And so they started walking away. Right as Mordecai Ham starts preaching. And one of the ushers sees him and says, hey, I'll help you find some seats. And he, he shakes their hand, he smiles at them, and he helps them find two seats. And they sit down and they listen as this preacher preaches. And eventually he gives the invitation for people to respond. And these two 14-year-old boys, they did. They stood up and they walked. They walked down the aisle and they gave their lives to Jesus. Those two boys were Billy Graham and Grady Wilson. Who are they? Well, hopefully you know who Billy Graham is. Just passed away. Maybe the greatest evangelist ever. Preached to millions. A hundred years of faithfulness. And Grady Wilson organized all of his crusades around the world. And yet maybe it wouldn't have happened unless someone said yes to God. Unless someone would preach, right? And so we look at that and we go, wow, thank goodness for the faithfulness of Mordecai Ham to preach to those boys so they could respond. That's true. But I'll tell you what, there's an unsung hero of the story, the anonymous usher, who simply did what he always did, help people find a seat. He said yes to God, his heart was open to God, and history was forever changed because of it. Maybe you're here today and you're like, well, this is a great story, but I don't feel like a Daniel. I don't feel like I have a whole lot of big faith. I don't feel like a, a rock star of the Bible. You don't have to be. You have to be you. God doesn't need you to be someone else. 
He needs you to be who he created you to be. And he takes great pleasure in using us when we don't feel like alone we're enough. And if we will keep going and we will trust and depend in him, it's going to blow our minds when we watch what he can do in and through us. We have no idea what God can do in and through us when we open our hearts up to him. And I want to invite you this morning to open your heart up to God. So here's what I invite you to do. A couple things. I want you to find the worship program that you were handed when you walked in. I want you to take out the notes section because there's some prayers written in there. I want you to follow along. And then I want you to have this card that's inside, this white card, handy as well. And once you find those, would you bow your heads with me this morning as we pray? There are two prayers listed in your notes this morning. I just kind of want to lead you through them. I want to invite you to say one of two prayers today. With every head bowed, eyes closed, maybe you would say, the first prayer is mine. God, I need you in my life. That's when you're willing and ready to surrender to life lived God's way, not your way. You can't stand strong in your own strength. You need the supernatural strength of God. And it is available today through Jesus on your behalf. And you can receive that power and that strength by first admitting your weakness and saying, God, I know I have sinned. I have done wrong. I've offended you. I've missed the standard of perfection that you have. I know I've blown it. Everybody has. And that the punishment for that is separation from God forever in a real place called hell. But today, God, I want to receive your forgiveness and love through what Jesus did on the cross in my place. I want your forgiveness. I want your freedom. I want your wisdom. I want your leadership. And I want your strength. God, I need you in my life. If you're ready to make that decision, indicating that you're ready to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ today, just silently, right where you are, between you and God, just tell him, say, God, I need you in my life. That's the first prayer. And if that's the prayer that you just said between you and God, I would love to pray for you this week. And you can indicate that by checking the box on the bottom of the white card that says prayer number one. And the second prayer is written out for you in your notes. It's a prayer of trust. thanksgiving and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ I want to invite you this week to pray this every single morning pray this prayer and I'm going to pray for you right now God I trust you today I trust your plan for my life even when all I can see are my problems God help me be faithful in my responsibilities and faultless in my character forgive me where I have fallen short Thank you, God, for your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Today, God, I trust your capability and choose not to be trapped by compromise. God, I ask that you would use me to live lovingly in a world that is hostile to you. I want to invite you to pray that prayer every single day for the next seven days. And ask God to help you remain faithful in your responsibilities and faultless in your character. And the only way that we can have that kind of power to stand strong when we're overwhelmed by circumstances or feel like we've been tossed in the lion's den is because of the name and the person of Jesus Christ. He's the one that we want to celebrate today. We hope that this service was just what you needed today. Whether you've been around church your whole life 
or today was your very first time, we believe that God has something for you and your life. If God revealed the next step for you, would you share that with us? We would love to pray for you. You can share questions or prayer requests through our app or at info at WorcesterGrace.org. This online service was made possible through your generous gifts. If you'd like to contribute to the ministry of Grace Church, text Grace Church Woo to 77977 to begin. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you right back here next week.